Um, this is, of course, the most fun day of the year because we get to, uh, first of all, start by announcing some special awards from the department. And um, then we're going to move on to the piece where we acknowledge all of the people who finally got there. <laughs> so um, let's start with um, the uh, peer mentor awards. Um, every summer we get a new batch of MS and PhD students who come in and uh, we try and enhance their experience by pairing them with a more experienced graduate student who serves as their peer mentor. And the mentor's charge is to support the new students in the transition to graduate school, which is uh, sometimes traumatic and uh, sometimes um, wonderful and easy and straightforward. Um, but either way, it's good to have somebody help guide you along the way. And uh, these mentors serve as a source of advice, friendship, support for their mentees. And the, each year we award three, three people and we want to recognize them with outstanding mentor awards. And these are the people you see up on the screen here. Uh, this year, the outstanding mentor awards go to uh, Julia Dona, Ashlyn Giddings, and Luke Caitlin. So, if you're here, please come up to the stage and accept your award. And. Um, Margaret is going to come stand and we're going to take a photo together. <laughs> okay, congratulations and many thanks actually to all of the mentors for their contributions towards creating a supportive environment here at Scripps. Next on the list, we have uh, teaching assistants. And um, as any, everybody knows who's taken any classes back in their undergraduate days, and some even in their graduate days, the teaching assistants are a critical resource for Scripps faculty and students. And uh, we have a mechanism to honor them through the annual teaching assistant awards. And here are the four winners of this year's awards. Each of them um, is being recognized for their specific contributions to a class where they were a TA this year. Um, and there's Travis Klo, who was um, uh, an assistant in um, the well-known SIO 110. Everybody knows what that is, right? <laughs> <laughs> the introduction to GIS and GPS for scientists. I hear it's useful in Antarctica. Sometimes. Uh, Rebecca Cohen for SIO 133, Marine Mammal Biology. Shane Finnerty for SIO 136, the Marine Biology Laboratory. And Maitri Nagaka for one, SIO 126, Marine Microbiology. And will you all please come up to the stage so that we can recognize you? <laughs> Okay, so there aren't just teaching assistants, there are actually occasionally teachers as well. <laughs> and um, the next people I want to recognize are the recipients of our annual teaching awards, and we have two of these, one for undergraduate education uh, teaching and the other for graduate teaching. Um, Professor Dee Dee Lyons is uh, on being honored for her exemplary work in undergraduate teaching. Unfortunately, she can't be here today but I think we need to make a loud noise to acknowledge her anyway. And um, in graduate teaching, um, we uh, want to acknowledge the 
strong efforts of Dr. Luke Thompson, who has uh, been teaching a graduate class in uh, Python for data analysis, which is sweeping the world. And um, I hope he's going to come up here and receive his award. Okay, congratulations to all those people. Now, finally in the awards category, um, I'd like to honor the winner of the 24th annual Edward A. Freeman Director's Prize for Graduate Student Research. This is an award that was established in 1996 to honor the eighth director of Scripps on his 70th birthday. And um, I actually remember when this was established because I served on the first ever selection committee. Um, this year, where where we, you get to read a bunch of papers from all sorts of graduate students across Scripps, and then one best one is selected. And this year's winner is Patrick Brunson, and uh, we'd like to ask that Patrick and his advisors, Brad Moore and Andy Allen, come up and for a photo, and then... Um <laughs> Now, uh, what's going to happen, I believe, is that uh, Patrick is going to come and tell us, a, tell us a little bit about what he did. <laughs> He's going to read the paper to us? Sure. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this great honor. Um, first, I want to start off by thanking my uh, advisors, uh, Professor Brad Moore and Professor Andy Allen, for mentoring me for the past four years now. And I also want to extend a really huge thank you to the Graduate Division for this recognition. It's really a huge honor to get to uh, receive this award in one of the leading um, oceanographic institutions in the entire world. So this is really quite a great honor. Um, I'd like to take um, time today to talk about our paper on domoic acid biosynthesis and how we were able to connect genes to chemistry to better understand toxin production by harmful algal blooms. Next slide, please. So harmful algal blooms, especially marine harmful algal blooms, are common occurrences in uh, the marine environment. Uh, they occur when a select type of algae take over the uh, coastal environment. And we've been really quite lucky here in uh, Southern California lately because we've gotten some really pretty light shows by some uh, fluorescent algae. But we do know from events that have happened in Florida past this, this past year and also in 2015 of, of our own mega bloom along the California coast that these blooms can be much more insidious, especially in the way that they are able to produce small molecule toxins. A lot of recent work has come out lately showing that harmful algal blooms are very likely becoming worse with climate change. So it is imperative that we put more effort into studying how, when, and why these kinds of blooms make their toxins. Uh, next slide, please. So the one question that I like to think a lot about is how do we mitigate harmful algal blooms? Because once they've sort of started, there's really no stopping them. So there's a whole lot of different things that we need to think about in order to better mitigate these kinds of things. We need better monitoring. So we need to think about can we detect these toxins in the water or can we uh, detect toxic organisms in the water? We also need to think about um, ways in which we can better forecast. So we need to know what kinds of oceanic conditions are, are going to promote the most toxic events. And then finally, we also need to think about better regulations so that we can sort of minimize these kinds of events happening and better protect human health. One area that I think has been um, largely looked over, especially for marine organisms, is studying these th this um, whole event of toxin production at the genetic level. And so our idea is that if we can track these genes that are responsible for the biosynthesis of these toxins, then we can not only infer a bloom's ability to, produ to produce select toxins, but also to better understand how the environment can influence gene activity to promote the most toxic events. Next slide, please. 
So I want to take you back to 2015, in which we saw the largest harmful algal bloom ever recorded. Uh, it happened right off uh, our coastline, so off of the entire North American coast. And this bloom was dominated by diatoms that belong to the genus Pseudonychia that are known producers of the toxin uh, domoic acid. And this bloom was so detrimental because of the high levels of domoic acid, uh, we saw beaches and fisheries closing along the entire coastline. Um, one such fishery in the U.S. was the uh, Dungeness crab season, which was closed for most of the year. Um, they actually lost $97 million in revenue. And I think that the uh, sort of economic reach of this one event is still not completely understood. Next slide, please. So all of this is just from one tiny toxin. This is uh, domoic acid. Uh, its chemical structure is shown up here on the upper left-hand corner. It is a neurotoxin produced by diatoms belonging to the HAB genus Pseudonychia. And we're worried about domoic acid because it tends to accumulate in seafood. So whenever we or marine mammals or birds eat something that's been contaminated with, with uh, domoic acid, they can get very, very sick. For example, in humans, if we consume domoic acid, we can come down with amnesic shellfish poisoning, which is a life-threatening illness that can also uh, permanently mess up your short-term memory. We're also increasingly finding that um, chronic low-dose exposure is also potentially detrimental. And as I said before, it can also um, impact marine mammals and birds. I'd like to note that b before our study, we set out to find the genes that encode the production of this toxin right here. And so, because these were unknown prior to this uh, study, and we wanted to try to find those to, to, to better be able to monitor for domoic acid production in the environment. Next slide, please. Just to complicate matters, uh, not all harmful algal blooms appear to be toxic. This was a paper released uh, last year studying Monterey Bay during two different Pseudonychia bloom events. In 2015, they saw that there were high amounts of Pseudonychia cells, just like in fall of 2013. But in 2015, there was record amounts of domoic acid detected in the bay. Whereas in uh, fall of 2013, the levels of, of domoic acid was almost negligible. It was much, much lower, orders of magnitude lower. Now we can think about the different reasons as to why this might happen. For example, in 2015, it was a bloom that was dominated by much more toxic species of Pseudonychia. But we would be amiss to sort of ignore the effects of oceanographic input into these sorts of systems. We do know that, that uh, silicate was one nutrient that was heavily depleted during the 2015 event. And we like thinking about these kinds of nutrients in part because of what we found through laboratory studies. Next slide, please. So in the lab, people have, have identified a variety of different factors which can influence the amount of domoic acid that's produced in cultures. Everything ranging from nutrients, like limiting phosphate, limiting silica like we saw in the bay, increasing CO2, everything from the associated bacteria, and many more things. Now, there's a whole lot of different factors that are going on here that directly control domoic acid, but we didn't know exactly how domoic acid production was being controlled. So the hypothesis that we made was that these different environmental factors might be controlling production of domoic acid at the genetic level or at the transcriptional level. In other words, if we subject diatoms and culture to culturing conditions that might turn on domoic acid, we might also see gene transcription for the domoic acid biosynthetic genes also turning on. So if we take a sequence-driven transcriptomics approach and we are able to quantify transcription under these sorts of circumstances, we might be able to tie DA-inducing conditions back to the genes that are directly responsible for producing DA. One such study that we used to kind of leverage our sort of work here um, was published by one of our co-authors, uh, a Professor Dave Hutchins up at uh, USC, and he found this very interesting combinatorial effect between phosphate limitation and increasing CO2 that seemed to produce a very nuanced sort of effect on domoic acid production in culture. So we took all those different conditions, we, we, we sequenced them, just to uh, make a long story uh, much shorter, we, we sequenced them, we quantified their transcripts, and then we wanted to go look for the uh, domoic acid biosynthetic genes in that data set. Next slide, please. So that's exactly what we did. 
So the Pseudonychia genome um, is rather complex. It's got, over, uh, it's got almost 20,000 different transcripts associated with it. This is one of the reasons why it was so hard to find these genes in the first place. Uh, we found that there was about 500 genes that were upregulated under limiting phosphate, which is sort of on the level of other studies that have been done on diatoms under limiting phosphate conditions. The really interesting part was when we combined this data set of upregulated genes under limiting phosphate, and we also looked at the genes that were turning on under increasing CO2, and we found that that was limited to just 45 genes that turned on under the combination of both conditions. And among those genes were some very biochemically tantalizing uh, transcripts, including things that catalyzed terpene chemistry and oxidative chemistry, things that we predicted to be hallmarks of domoic acid biosynthesis. So we had some good candidates from this data set, but next slide, please. When we went back to the genome, we were even more surprised to find that these were all located in the same genomic region. And this, at least in bacteria and, and fungi and a couple of other organisms, this is a smoking gun for um, genes being involved in a common biochemical process. So because these genes were upregulated under these domoic acid-inducing conditions, and because they were clustered in the genomes of multiple domoic acid-producing um, diatoms, we thought that these would be great candidates to then follow up for, um, for biochemical interrogation. Next slide, please. And then, so that's exactly what we did. So we found that um, there are three main enzymes involved in biosynthesizing the core of, um, of domoic acid. So you can take two precursors, L-glutamate and geronyl pyrophosphate, molecules common to all of life, and you can combine them using the first enzyme to make l n geronylated glutamate. Then you can do successive oxidative reactions and then cyclize the whole thing by the enzymes DAB-D and DAB-C, respectively, to get us all the way to domoic acid. And I think that it goes with, without saying that all of this was a monumental effort that, that required a, a lot of synthetic chemistry, a lot of biochemistry, a lot of structural determination, and I, I could not have done any of this work without the mentorship and guidance of uh, postdoc Dr. Sean McKinney, who is soon to be a, a professor at UC Santa Cruz. So he is the co-first author on this paper as well, and I also have to extend my thanks to him as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got these genes. Now what do we do with them? Um, so we really want to see if we can detect the DAB genes in the environment. And what we want to do is we want to be able to sequence blooms. We want to be able to take blooms and sequence their RNA, sequence their DNA, and see if we can detect both presence of these DA genes, which I was thrilled to name the DAB genes, um, and, and then so we can see their their activity and their presence during blooms. So we hope that we can use this information to better understand what makes blooms so toxic and what makes some blooms toxic and what makes other blooms not so toxic. Uh, next slide, please. So what we hope to achieve by using this sort of genetic system is, to, is a more full understanding of how domoic acid biosynthesis works so we can better forecast blooms and, and predict the most toxic occurrences. Next slide, please. And I have a lot of people to thank, of course, including both of my mentors, Professor uh, Brad Moore and Andy Allen, uh, a whole bevy of postdocs, in including uh, Dr. Sean McKinney, soon to be uh, Professor Sean McKinney, Dr. Jonathan Cheekin, and a whole list of all kinds of other people who um, helped get me to where I am today. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can see why he won an award. <laughs> that was great. Thanks so much, Patrick. Thank you. So uh, now we are going to celebrate our graduating class of Scripps Institution of Oceanography students. And I'm going to ask Director Leinen to come and stand on the blue X. <laughs> Thank you. And she will shake hands and pose for a photo with each of, their, each of our students as I read their names and they walk across the stage. And we're going to start with our master's degree program, degree students. Uh, and first of all, first up, uh, the uh, Master of Advanced Studies, Climate Science and Policy class. And uh, if each of you will come forward when your name is called, that would be a perfect um, thing to do. <laughs> 
at this point. Kai Anderson. Uh, Kai Atkinson. Sorry. <laughs> and don't forget to leave. Next is Michael Baker. Melina Cunha. Mackenzie Elmer. Lindsay Jaspers. Takuma Otaki. <laughs> Filippo Radice Fossati. <laughs> Audrey Tam. So that was our first MAS program. We're also honoring our graduating class of Masters of Advanced Studies, Marine Biodiversity and Conservation students. Um, and again, please come forward when your name is called. And first of all, we have Thompson Banez. James Bruce and the youngest student ever. <laughs> Ross Cooper. <laughs> Justin Cruz. Mark Danielson. <laughs> Nicholas Donetso. <laughs> Crystal Dombro. Victoria Hermanson. Hilliard Hicks. Cynthia Shah. Emily Cook. <laughs> Kaylee Lane. <laughs> Catherine Meyer. Montgomery. <laughs> Laura Muller. <laughs> Catherine Renown. Vanessa Scott. Carly Shabo. Daria Sheikh. Hi. 
Greta Tannenbaum. Chrissy Tosterson. Jared Versteeg. <laughs> Bert Weeks. <laughs> and Katya Whittam. So that brings us to the end of the Master of Advanced Studies. Congratulations to all of those folks. And next up, we are celebrating the graduation of over 20 Master of Science students uh, in various programs here, Earth Science, Marine Biology, not yet in Ocean and Atmospheric Science, but it's coming soon. And uh, so these are another second group of people. Uh, let's start with them. Michelle Bibbins. There are more than 20 of them, but I see I've got a short line here. <laughs> Shane Finnerty. Laura Furtado. Madison Geese. Cameron Hasibi. Rebecca Hernandez. Samuel Kekuera. Kotachi Liu Gregory Mamikunian Emily McLaughlin Wendy Muraoka. Colby Nicholson. Caitlin Pedersen. Olivia Pereira. Michelle Marie Prieto. <laughs> Zoe Seabright. <laughs> Zachary Skelton. Lead. <laughs> Jessica Sportelli. <laughs> Leah Werner. <laughs> T. 
Tian Han Shu. So that was quite a lineup. Um, and uh, now we're going to get to the long timers. <laughs> The people who have uh, finished a PhD, who have or will receive their PhD degrees this year. There are more than 40 Scripps students who have done this. And not all of them are here today. As with the master's students, you'll see that some of them have moved on already to the new positions and new exciting things in life. But those who are today, please, I'm going to read all the names. Those who are here, please come forward when your name's read. So we are going to start with Marion Alberti. <laughs> Dita Bevans. <laughs> Michael Bianco. <laughs> Amanda Carter. Crystal Chavaria. <laughs> Zhao Chen. <laughs> Matthew Cook. <laughs> John DeSanto. Rachel Diner. Adrian Doran. Jonathan Eliashiv. Tiago Ferreira Leal. <laughs> Eric Gallimore. <laughs> Natalia Gallo. Alfredo Hiron. <laughs> Dara Goldberg. <laughs> Regina Guazzo. <laughs> Ryan Guillemette. Alice Harada. <laughs> Madeleine Harvey. <laughs> Brian House. <laughs> Bryce Inman. Arjun Jagannathan. Sarah Lurch. Caitlin Lauder. Nathan Moss.
Angelica Rodriguez. Erica Rosenblum. Jesse Saunders. Travis Schrammick. Ryan Scott. Brian Stock. Nick Tuttle. And Lynn Waterhouse. Benjamin Whitmore. Catherine Wilson. <laughs> Catherine Zaba. <laughs> and last but not least, Jia Jia Zhang. So that's our group of graduating PhD students. Uh, thank you to Margaret for helping us celebrate. Thank you to our department staff who made all of this happen. and to all of the students and faculty who helped people along the way. And I'm going to turn it back to Margaret now. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, I hope a lot of you will be joining me tomorrow at commencement. If you are, we're smaller than some of the other schools, so make a lot of noise. <laughs> Let them know you're here, and we are so proud of you. One last thing, I'd like to have all the graduates stand up. Now, look around and find the people that came with you, whether they're friends or family or <laughs> partners, neighbors, and thank them for hanging in there with you. And all of you, Let's join them in one last hand. June gloom is over, it's time to party.